So PSA screening for prostate cancer, it's a perennial oh, topic. Always a controversial issue. Yeah. How many years on? 15 Continents years fighting on. each other. Exactly. You know, one whole lobby saying PSA, routine PSA screening causes more harm than good. Others saying that it's the best tool we have, etc. Et best biomarker still. Exactly. Good triage tool, but... Not perfect. Not perfect. That I think we can all accept. So very, very interesting uh, paper this week, which uh, gives us a whole new way of thinking about this whole topic of early detection of prostate cancer for men. Um, traditionally, we've tried to augment PSA testing or add in another little biomarker. This is that. What about don't do the PSA at all? Yeah. Well, that's what we're going to focus uh, on in um, this episode of GUcast. We got a fantastic couple of guests coming on from a big paper published in BMJ Oncology this week. So stay tuned for that. Absolutely. But first, as we always do, we've got our favourite Eva McVeigh back in the studio, and I want to say she's going to give us an update on Twitty leaks, but. Sadly, it's not Twitty Leaks anymore, and it's more like X Leaks. Yeah, I think we're, ha- we're having to change it to X Leaks. Aoife, like. I'm very depressed by the whole thing, though. It just it doesn't. A bit shit, you know the term. Yeah, I miss the little bird. Mm, yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. <laughs> so what's what's out there? What's new in the world of social media? Yeah, but well, look in general, I feel like everyone's still debating, especially in the UK, about uh, I suppose the physician associates, nurse practitioners, you know, those roles and and that sort of ongoing. There's still the usual stuff, but I suppose I've seen a few serious ones and a few more silly ones this week that I thought I'd share. Um, I think, uh, first of all, <laughs> the preloaded serious them stuff. So this is something that we've been talking about a lot, actually, in our own research meeting at Peter Mac, yeah. which we're all into artificial intelligence at the moment. It's a hot topic. Um, and actually, Stacey Loebetsin had published a paper in JAMA Oncology uh, looking at um, sort of assessing the different artificial intelligence chatbots for sort of sources of information uh, for patient information. So they looked at um, putting in questions about different big cancers um, and then seeing sort of the quality of the output of that and it looked pretty good to be honest so I think in terms of the information that was being provided it showed that it was good there was no sort of Im- misinformation uh, but again some issues in terms of I suppose the readability of it or the interpretation of it for patients so I thought you know it's a very good paper to first come out especially in the new sort of AI era um, and yeah I suppose more to come I think that's definitely an area that we were talking about would be very useful for AI in, in medicine so and I think it's a great paper because she's focused on the five most common cancers mm. and the most researched queries about those cancers. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, sort of common day-to-day things that you and I might research about the common cancers. So yeah. that's, I think that's a great read in JAMA Oncology. Very good. And Stacey yeah. has quite a lot of background in this. She's done mm. a lot of work looking at uh, disinformation, misinformation mm. with YouTube and prostate cancer and other stuff like that. So I think the arrival of AI fits right into an area yeah. of research interest that she has already. So well done, Stacey. Under the podcast. Yep. Yes, Loved absolutely, Stacey. Uh, and then on to, I suppose, more my theme, the silly ones that I've seen. So this was pretty <laughs> funny. I love his Twitter name as well, Mid- Medlife Crisis, um, which Robin, and it was the debate of tucked or untucked with scrubs. So that actually got 2 million views <laughs> and a lot of votes. And I think the unanimous vote was actually untucked, which I think is probably the UK and Australian way. So it's close sure though. It, yeah, very close, far. very close. I actually think they had someone in fashion actually weigh on in it and they actually said untucked. So maybe that's sort of drawing the line. Uh, under it all someone actually made a point about how there was a pocket in the bottom left so why would you tuck it you know you know <laughs> waste that nice pocket that you have but anyway I thought that was pretty funny um good. yeah and then this is another one I'd actually seen a couple of weeks ago um but this was a thread that came up about urologists that were tweeting their first papers and a lot of them are really esteemed sort of academic urologists now and it's really nice to see where they started. Like a lot of them will be, you know, case reports and, you know, like maybe not so well-known journals. And it sort of is good from someone from my perspective, especially sort of starting off in a career to see, you know, where people can start and where you can end up. And it's just important just to get involved in research um, and just keep putting stuff out there. So yeah, that's funny. Look, it was led by yeah. um, Ben Davies and you can see the usual suspects. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, Matt Nielsen, Todd Morgan, uh, Mo Alaf, all in there. Uh, yeah. I can tell you what mine was. If I was going to ask Declan and Renee, yeah. what were yours? Yeah, mine was a case <laughs> report. Um, it was this poor guy who cut off his own testicles in a <gasps> uh, public toilet in the emergency department <laughs> of oh the my God. hospital I was working in. So it was entitled um, Self-Castration, a Waiting List Initiative. 
uh, because the poor guy had said it was because he was struggling to you know get onto a waiting list to have gender reassignment surgery. So oh, very wow. tragic oh uh, thing, <laughs> really. But it was it was my first publication. So you remember your first a, publication, yeah. don't you? Yeah. What a way to start. Yeah, <laughs> mine was a little bit more serious, and I, I wasn't on Twitter at the time um, or X at the time. Uh, yeah. But it was just on lymph node dissection trends um, in a major Australian tertiary oncology institution. Conclusion. Oh, more things to read. <laughs> Higher lymph node yields, I think, over time. <laughs> <laughs> You're making it up now. You can't even remember what you published. I can't remember. <laughs> Uh, very good. Yeah. And you had one other look at this one. Yeah, always love a good dramatic video. So this is I seen this huge, yeah, oh. huge bladder stone. It's from uh, I think it's Medverse, and it's uh, open surgery, and they were moving an absolutely <laughs> massive bladder. So it sort of pops right up. Um, and yeah, you can't really miss that whenever you're scrolling past it in your feed. You just have to sort of watch it. And actually, on repeat, it's quite um, quite interesting to watch again and again. So there we are. Stones, Something like an say. open stone yeah. retrieval. Never let Very it be said, we don't do some stone <laughs> surgery on this podcast, uh, Renee. Yeah, exactly. And, and how, is, how is X? You know, how is your X experience? Um, look, I actually have come around to it. I actually find that, you know, whenever you search the app on your iPhone, if you type in Twitter or start to do TWI, it still comes up X. So I feel like I've, I've come to terms with it. But you guys have just said before, maybe you're still still adjusting. Not sure. It's like it's going to the dark side. It just seems a bit miserable. I yeah. mean, everyone we yeah, speak to on the podcast says the same thing. And, yeah. and I was listening to a podcast the other day, a, a more of a politics podcast, but they there were journalists describing the imminent demise that the business model is gone oh, and okay. it will go and something yeah. else will take its place, which seems really mm. sad. Uh, they were the same journalists, you know, use this a lot, have used it a lot. And yeah. um, it's been quite useful for us in academic urology. It's been very enjoyable, actually, hasn't it? So but that's yeah. why we're branching to TikTok. Yes, we yeah. are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. TikTok. So we go to TikTok. Yeah. Without uh, maybe the dancing and all that sort of business. Well, thank you, yeah. Aoife, yeah, for no that place, guys. great update. Now, we don't have to go on X anymore. We just invite Aoife along to every podcast <laughs> exactly. and she gives us the useful updates. And, and I wonder <laughs> what our guests make of all this Twitter stuff and all that as well. So we're we're really thrilled to welcome back, um, a, well, certainly a friend of the podcast because Dr. Professor Caroline Moore was on the very first episode of she GUcast was, three and yes. a half years ago, wasn't yeah, she? Yeah, it um, was a long time ago. Which is fantastic. So Caroline's back um, uh, along with um, uh, Shonet, uh, uh, Shonet Podcast. Wani is a, a radiologist at UCL. Uh, so it's a great privilege to welcome you two uh, to GUcast and congratulations on this paper. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Nice to be here. Fantastic. So yeah. Caroline is a urologist, uh, for those of you who don't know. She's a contemporary of mine. We, we pretty much trained together um, in the UK. Um, and she's professor of urology at uh, UCL. Her name is obviously very well known for anyone working in the fields of early detection of prostate cancer, focal therapy, prostate biopsy, uh, because she's been involved in some big pivotal studies. Um, and Shonet, uh, you're a radiologist very specialized in MR, uh, looking at uh, novel technologies in MR, I gather as well. Um, and the pair of you work together at UCL and uh, UCLH. Um, so yeah, thanks for joining us. And, and as we said at the outset, uh, Renu, part of the backdrop for this is uh, the ongoing frustration with um, you know, almost screening for prostate cancer using PSA being a dirty word uh, pretty yeah, much, you absolutely. know, in, in, in many guidelines around the world and many primary care guidelines, etc. cetera. Um, USPSTF in the US, all sorts of confusion over the years. Pretty much everyone has said, look, that this is not, therefore it's not used. Therefore there is no screening program anywhere around the world. It's all yeah. opportunistic, random screening really using PSA. Um, and despite all the, the attempts to try and improve that, and indeed MR has had a key role in as a triage tool after someone's presented with a raised PSA to determine does that person uh, need a biopsy and if they do at least they get a targeted biopsy uh, but this is a very disruptive idea uh, Caroline in this fantastic study you've just published in BMJ Oncology we'll include a link in the show notes it's the reimagined study um, mm -hmm. the prevalence of MR lesions in men responding to a GP-led invitation for a prostate health check a prospective study and, you know, I think, I mean, that's the really exciting part about it is that MRI has been studied quite extensively in the early detection uh, scene and it's become routine practice, especially for us in Australia. But this is really the first time it's been studied in a screening population completely independent of a PSA. So yes. that's, that's so, really So this cool. is just men in a GP practice not having had a PSA necessarily being invited along for an MRI scan. Uh, <laughs> in a, so tell us all about it. Yeah, so... Um, Interesting time. So just to say, in terms of a screening program, Lithuania has a PSA-based screening program, only country in the world. 
introduced reasonably recently and has led to a lot of overdiagnosis, which is why a lot of the world obviously doesn't doesn't do PSA screening. So we've seen the benefits of MRI for men with a raised PSA. We know it means that you get uh, one in three men or maybe half of the men can avoid a biopsy. So we asked the question, what happens if we move that back and do a short MRI scan as a screening test? So we offered men from the GP practice a PSA test and an MRI test at the same time. And then men could either screen positive based on the MRI scan or based on a raised PSA density. So not the absolute value of PSA, but the PSA divided by the volume of the prostate. Very good. Um, so yeah. what did you find? What did you find? So around one in five men said yes to the invitation. So a little bit lower than we would have liked, but we started in December 2019. We stopped, as most of the world did, in April 2020. We restarted in July, so still pretty heavy pandemic time. So that, that may well have affected things. And we found that overall, one in five men screened positive. So the commonest positive screen was with the MRI. But for men with a negative MRI, as a backup, because we know that not all tumours are visible on MRI, we used a PSA density of 0.12 and about 1 in 20 men with a negative MRI had a positive PSA density. Mm -hmm. And then those positive screens got referred into NHS practice, where they then had our standard of care, which is the standard multiparametric MRI and a biopsy if there's a lesion on multiparametric MRI, or a raised PSA density or concerns for other, other causes. And we essentially found that MRI was the most predictive for prostate cancer. And of the 25 significant cancers that we saw on MRI, half of those, just over half, 15 out of 25, had a PSA of less than three. Mm. Wow. So if we've done a PSA-based approach, we would have missed. Yeah half of the significant cancers that we found. And we the other, the other bit that was really useful, so when you look at many screening programs, you find that screening studies, you find that the ratio of significant to insignificant might be half and half, maybe a third insignificant. In ours, it was um, 29 men with significant cancer, three men with insignificant or Gleason 3 plus 3. So really changed the metric on overdiagnosis with this approach as well. Amazing. amazing. And Shonis, um, I, I got a lot of media in the UK over the past few days, I can see, and a lot of the focus was on a 10 minute scan. Um, and for any of, uh, any of the audience out there who've had their prostate uh, MRI scanned like me, I spent 34 minutes in it. It wasn't the most pleasant thing in the world. So can you tell us uh, about this 10 minute uh, MRI scan? Yeah. Um so, uh, as you said, you know, a normal multiparametric MR takes between 30 to 40 minutes, and um, you need an um, injection of contrast at the moment as well as part of that. Um, I think one thing we have to put into context here, when people now have multiparametric MRI after they have an elevated PSA, they actually, because of their elevated PSA, have a higher risk, presumably, of having prostate cancer. Multiparametric MRI is really designed to be very sensitive, so as the papers have shown you, there's a 90% sensitivity for significant disease, but actually specificity is on the order of 40 to 50%. But when we went and thought about the uh, reimagined study, one of the things we were thinking was, well, how do we get a test which is a faster, but actually more specific? And so what we wanted to do was to have a look at the sequences that we use in multicomerative MI and ask the question, where do we definitely see disease? And the two sequences you see it on, one is the T2 sequence, and the other one is a high diffusion uh, weighted sequence. So those were the two sequences we used out of the entire 30 minute MRI, and that's what formed the 10 minute test. So I'm not surprised actually by the results because we found disease which was, when it was biopsied, actually present much more often than we would with multiparametric MRI. The specificity is really high. What's shocking is how much disease there is out there, particularly with men with a low PSA. So we haven't done anything fancy. We've just taken components of the multiparametric MRI test, the ones which we know will pick up disease, and implemented them into the screening setting. 
And Shona, what about the what about the Pirates Three lesion? So were they categorised as a an MRI positive lesion, or were they then kind of categorised into an MRI negative but PSA density uh, treated according yeah, so to the PSA other thing, density? The other thing we did, um, which parallels what happens in breast imaging to some extent is we had radiologists, three of them, potentially looking at the uh, MPMRI, so the, the abbreviated fast screening MR scan. And in essence, they had to say it was a screen positive or screen negative. And we used a very simple scoring system for this. If there's a white blob on your diffusion and a black blob on your T2 and they both correspond, it's a screen positive. So if two of the radiologists essentially said it was screen positive, the third one didn't need to have a look. If the two radiologists, the first two disagreed, a third one came in and said, I go with this or I go with that. But there is no Pyrans 3. Um, mm -hmm. We haven't scored it uh, in that way. I get it. Okay. So it's, it's much, much more straightforward. Yeah. It's positive, negative, and then you go down a pathway. Exactly. And that, well, that's kind of amazing, isn't it, that you can do a scan? I'm just thinking straight away how much more of an MR, even a multi-parametric or can we cut out uh, to get down to 10 minutes? I mean, the cost savings. Contrast obviously seems to be mm -hmm. almost gone, isn't it? Or it's gone in very many jurisdictions. We still pretty much use contrast enhancement all the time. But in some MR units around Melbourne, it's not used. And um, obviously, there are trials ongoing, the prime study uh, uh, looking at that. Um, but what else? So T1, you don't do any T1 weighted images. You don't do an ADC no. map. Uh, so it's just the high B value no. weighted imaging and T2, just axial for both, I suppose. And that's it. Yeah. It was, it was a really simple test to do and a stupidly simple test to report. It takes the radiologist 30 seconds to say positive or negative looking at it. There you go. Oh, and what about cost savings? How much does it ha I mean, how feasible is it to have this in a screening setting? Uh, well, that's, that's a really good question. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my opinion and then Caroline can um, tell you what she thinks. <laughs> I think as a test, this is going to be um, just at the sweet spot for picking up exactly what we want to pick up and not seeing the bits we don't want to see. The difficulty at the moment is, is really a case of who do you give this to? Do you apply to everyone? Do you sub-select the population? And, and maybe Caroline, you've got some thoughts around that. Yeah, so I think it is, of course, more costly than a PSA test, but in the UK, our age standardized mortality is about 50% higher than comparable countries like um, the US, France, Italy, Spain. And late stage disease is really expensive because we've got some really good treatments that keep men alive for a lot longer, but they're not, uh, they're not particularly cheap. So there's a lot of costs associated with late disease. And of course, not only financial costs, but burden to the patient, burden to society. And the avoiding overdiagnosis, so our overdiagnosis rates were much less than the sort of single PSA testing that they did in CAP, much less than ERSPC. So even though we're picking up more disease, we're, we're, we're overdiagnosing less. So I hope, but we don't know yet, that the health economics would work out. I think there's enough to say that it is worth doing a large trial to look at this and to work out more on the on the health economics. This was a smallish study, and we can make some models on the health economics. But um, for a full analysis, you need it. You need a bigger study as well. Yeah. Just, I know to, be just to pick up. Sorry, Shannon. I was going to say just to pick up on the back of that, uh, the number of people that got biopsy that did not have significant cancer was minuscule. I mean, it was tiny. If you got a biopsy, you needed it. But what was a, an issue is the number of people who went on to have a multi-parametric MRI, which is, of course, now provided in secondary care as another test. And a proportion of those, a reasonable proportion, did not have something that needed a biopsy. So the real question, and one of the things we're looking at in terms of our next uh, bit of work, is how do you get the specificity um, of the bi-parametric uh, early screening MR even better? And can you do that within 15 minutes? So some of the new sequences we were looking at might give you that option. Um, and so we will, within the next, I think, two, three years, as part of the LIMIT trial, which is a subsequent trial to the uh, reimagined study, hopefully answer that question as well. So yeah. if I heard you correctly, some of the men who screened positive on the 10-minute screening scan 
went on and had a multi-parametric and it turns out it was a normal scan or equivocal. So exactly. you accept that in a 10 minute scan. Exactly. But I, I mean, I, I, I think, I think we're going to get to a 15 minute scan and yep. it will be the only scan you have. And you do not then need to have a multi-parametric MRI. You'll be told when you need a biopsy or when you don't, and that would be the end of it. Caroline, a lot of people will want to know a bit more detail about uh, what we, what you found in terms of significant disease, because uh, with PSAs, the median PSA was two or something, and yeah, half of men with PSAs uh, less than two, less than three. Um, you know, people might scratch their head. Well, what was your definition of clinically significant yeah, cancer yeah. on the biopsy? Uh, so, can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so we defined it as Gleason three plus four. Um, and we know that it would have been MR visible, at least in three plus four, which we know adds another layer of significance. But we had some really surprising, massive high de high burden disease with low PSA. So there's one chap with a PSA of two. He had Gleason four plus five disease. We had in the you, you, in the, in the UK the the chap who was on the BBC um, kind of breakfast news. He had, I think his PSA was around 1.7. He had Gleason 4 plus 3, 4 millimetres. So we are picking up some properly. This isn't all 1 millimetre, 3 plus 4. This is properly significant disease in there. So it was uh, it was surprising even to us. And we're, you know, we've, we've known for a long time that MR is better than PSA, but we were surprised by how much. I think there were um, four different Gleason 4 plus 5s picked up in the study. So... Yeah, I mean, I, I'm shaking my head. It's um, and you know, lots of patients listen to this podcast as well, and they're they, they're worried about their PSA or about the reliability of PSA alone. We all are, but I think this study really reminds us about the limitations of PSA alone approaches, or even PSA augmented by PSA density in some shape or form. Um, but I suppose the big question is how how would it translate? What is your plan for a larger trial or a health yeah. economic study? Because I think the, the findings are absolutely sensational, just amazing. And I, for one, will certainly be um, requesting MRs at lower PSAs, I think. Yeah. I mean, we, I think we've all learned that. We all see these patients, but I didn't think it was as dramatic as this prospective yeah. population cohort study is showing us. Because um, uh, uh, I think we need to be using MR more and more often. That's my personal view. Um, uh, I mean, we're a little bit limited by the MRI rebate um, indications. And, you know, often we are tempted to order yeah. an MRI that fits outside those indications. And this is a very strong case yeah. to be made for that so for Caroline, that. And just to tell you how it works in australia we have widespread access to mr in the early detection setting since 2018 since you published uh, the precision study but there are limits on it and for example your psa depending on your age group needs to be above 5.5 or mm. you know it, it within older age groups etc or there has to be a palpable abnormality etc so there is some you know reasonable um uh, barriers put in place so that we're not routinely using multi-parametric mr too often uh, but we might have to revisit all that as these yeah. sorts of studies pan out, and especially if this 10-minute um, screening scan, simple you know, yes-no scan, uh, can be introduced into practice, because I still think it will be a very, very attractive way of trying to find those patients that PSA won't find. Mm. So yeah, what is next? Uh, yes, yeah. tell well, us about the well, next stage. Yeah. Uh, uh, just a note for the paper, the, the list of all the biopsy positive characteristics are in the appendix for those, those urologists who want to go and look at it all really carefully. Absolutely. Um, a very detailed appendix, which is great. Yeah. In terms of what's next, so the LIMIT study is funded and ready to go. So that has a similar approach. It's 800 men. 600 of those will be between three different hospitals, so Cambridge, Manchester and UCL. And then 200 of the men will be in a community-based van because one of the other significant findings that we had in Reimagine was that black men were much less likely to take up the invitation. So the response rate in black men was around 7.8% versus 28% in white men. And of course, we know that they're at twice the risk of prostate cancer. So the, the van will be situated and invitations will go out um, in the black community and other areas, encouraging people to come forward, not going through the traditional GP kind of letter of invitation route. And that one will be starting fairly soon. And then what we're hoping, but which isn't yet funded, is a large collaborative study in the UK, coordinated by Prostate Cancer UK, probably with multiple funders, looking at a much larger population-based screening 
study, which if it shows similar results or is shown to be helpful, would lead to a programme. But that one's not not fully funded as yet, so we're uh, we're waiting and hoping. Yeah. I just love it. I think just think it's fantastic. fantastic. Sensational. And what if so if you were going to hypothesize what would happen in the future? I mean, if this was all approved in a screening setting and a man has a, a you know, a 15-minute biparametric MRI and it's it's screen negative, what's mm-hmm. next for him? Does he get another MRI in a few years time? Are they then followed up with PSA? What what do you propose for for a man yes. who has a negative screening MRI? So I think there's a few unanswered questions. In all successful screening programs, you retest because you know that men don't have a disease at a certain point and it can develop. Mm -hmm. And we don't know what the retest interval should be. I suspect with MRI, it'll probably be fairly long, possibly five, eight, even 10 years. We also don't know what additional information we'd get from a change in PSA over time. So, in fact, my own dad had a low PSA, it was two, and it went up to three. That was below the cutoff at the time for referral of four. But his And I said, you'll be fine, dad, don't worry. His GP said, no, I think this is a significant rise. <laughs> he went to his local hospital in the, in the Midlands, not in London. They just started their MRI program and he actually had quite an aggressive four plus three oh. successfully treated. So that story about the a changing PSA is also relevant. Yeah. We need to explore that a bit more as well because we know that there's significant cancers out there. I remember you Absolutely. telling me that story before. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for laughing at it, but I remember the way you told it in a very self-deprecating yeah. way to me, uh, <laughs> in the past, Carla. I'm sure you feel yeah. very well. Well, it's yeah. true. You know, once you do have a screening MRI, then maybe the PSA becomes a bit more meaningful. Yeah. You know, it's kind of nuts. I just can't believe it. And so the the machine itself. So, so what sort of uh, magnet strength is it uh, shown out? Um, mm. uh, tell us a bit about it. Did you say it's on a truck? Is it in a? It's in the back of a van. We. we we're, not this one, but the next one will be a uh, scan in a van, yeah. Um, so this particular study, we used a three, t- three Tesla magnet. So it's a fairly strong magnet. Um, we wanted to do that because the diffusion imaging is better really at three Tesla. Uh, and we're only doing two imaging sequences. Uh, and so that, that's why we use that. I, I think you on the modern 1.5 test the machines may get similar results but you know we haven't done the study in that but the um, scan in the van will also be with the three tests of the magnet um, hopefully wow. in six months time and what else is going on in amor uh, as we wrap up on this topic because i know you that that is your interest is in novel technologies um both of you have nihr grants in the uk but uh, fellowships rather to pursue this topic of interest but i think your particular interest is in novel technologies in MR. So you know, tell us what's coming, what's coming yeah, down the road. Uh, I, I, I like playing with big machines uh, and I enjoy <laughs> working on prostate cancer uh, and some combining those. Um, I think there are three issues in prostate cancer. One is, can you get the right man scanned at the right time, which is all the screening question. And, and then the second issue actually is, once you've got a positive scan, how do you know who to biopsy? Can we reduce the false biopsy rate? At the moment, it's about 50% or so with uh, multi-parametric MR. One in two men doesn't need a biopsy. So I'm working on a technique um, called verdict MR, which the initial results demonstrate you could probably avoid 90% of the unnecessary biopsies. I mean, of course, first study, you need to prospectively move it forward, larger cohorts and so on. And the third question, which is even more important, I think, is once you've found a cancer, do you really know which cancers you need to treat? Most of the prostate cancer is not going to kill you, clearly. So how do you find the aggressive lesions? Uh, you could go on active surveillance. Um, and on the back of an active surveillance uh, program we have at UCL, I'm trying to develop a new technique called hyperpolarized MR, which sounds pretty fancy, but in essence, it's looking at metabolism, glucose metabolism in a two-minute scan in a standard MR scanner with a machine which allows you to do that. Um, and I'm hoping to find that metabolism is a predictor of aggressiveness, but it's early days for that one. Fascinating. Aoife, did you enjoy all that? No, I we, did. We, we, we I was like, to, that's um, broaching on nuclear medicine's territory. Yeah, yeah. so Aoife, that we'll, we'll reveal the news to the world that she's <laughs> transitioning over to radiology as a career. 
and um, mm. but we we know she'll retain an interest in urology yeah. and um, uh, yeah and that's yeah. why she likes X going over to the dark side. That's it, is it? Yes. <laughs> it's, it's in yeah. her personality. Right? It's a, it is amazing. We're just at the, the start of it, I think, for a lot yeah. of these. Uh, well, I've did a physics exam now coming up in March, so I feel like I've got a better understanding of MRIs, and I'm wondering how the van works. If you know the magnet, like yeah. how do the cars go and buy the van? Not you know. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I obviously don't it, understand it's it that got, well. Uh, it's got extremely good shielding, uh, yeah. which which helps, uh, but it needs a huge power supply, uh, and so you can't just park it anywhere. It has yeah. to be parked in an installation which provides that. Oh, yeah, we've just had to move a couple of MRs out of our building because they're yeah. they're, they're running new trains on an underground track, yeah, so they've yeah. had to yeah. relocate the whole MR imaging department out of Peter Max. Well, Declan, we're always joking that often we see a PSMA pet before we see a patient's PSA. Maybe we should put a pet yeah. scanner in the back of a van and yeah. do a uh, screening study. Michael Hoffman, if you're listening, he's in South <laughs> Africa at the moment, and he'll be saying, come on, let's talk about pet. But yeah. I, look, I, I really enjoyed that chat. That I think was it's really um, great. Sensational. It's well so hard, done. So and to down. recruit it's through COVID yeah. and um, to get... To, you know, to get such a great study out is, is an incredible feat. So congratulations to both of you and the rest of the team. Thank yeah, you. fantastic. And we'll put all the links uh, in the show notes. Um, thanks so much um, to Caroline and Shonit for joining us. It's actually a, a public holiday, a bank holiday in the UK today. So they kindly uh, got up and dialed in just to entertain us and educate us uh, about the MR for that's prostate. Right. So yeah, absolutely fantastic. And that's it for us for yeah. today. Nice, short, sweet podcast. Yeah, exactly. Um, we'll be back very soon with more. Uh, if you'd like to hear more about this, please do let us know. In the meantime, please do subscribe, uh, give us a rating, uh, spread the word, etc. And tell us what you want to listen to on GUcast. Uh, that's all we have time for. Thank you very much. Thank you.